Thanks, welcome. Uh, we're continuing on in Second Peter, and today we'll be reading Second uh, Peter chapter one, verses twelve to twenty-one. We'll talk at the end of the chapter. Now, last week, Kevin was introducing Second Peter, and uh, he sort of heading it up as confirming our calling or confirming your calling. And we said we must grow or die. Today we look at how we grow. We grow through the more sure word of the Lord. And that's probably a subheading for my topic, the more sure word of God. Let's read 2 Peter chapter 1. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it right to refresh your memory as long as I live in this tent of, of this body, because I know that I will soon be soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We received honour and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him in the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable and you will do well to pay attention to it as, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This passage breaks down very easily into three different sections. The first one is in verses 12 to 15, uh, remember what you have been taught. The second section is 16 to 18, the eyewitness account of the transfiguration. And verses 19 to 21, God's prophetic word. As I was studying this, uh, you look at different translations and I normally use the NIV. I've read the NIV here, but I want to read verse 12 from the King James Version. It just brings out a little bit different. He says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Most versions do not use that word negligent. And that loses just some of the impact of the word. W.E. Vine gives the meaning of negligent as to be careless, not to care. Peter was going to ensure that he could not be accused of being careless, of not caring. So he was prepared to stress the importance of his message even more. He was going to remind them of many Bible truths, even though they already knew them. He would remind them to the point of becoming a nuisance and even annoying, but that was better than neglecting the word. Peter knew that he was, had a ministry to fill, fill before he was taken home. The Apostle Paul would use this method of teaching also. We read in Philippians 3.1, there's Paul writing, It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. He says, I'll write these things again and again. It's a safeguard. And Jesus knew that we too would uh, forget very easily what the teaching from the word is. And Jesus said this on the night before he's betrayed, he said, this do in remembrance of me. He gave us a, a physical uh, reminder of what he was going to go through. But coming back to Peter, Peter uh, had an obligation to teach and to teach so that his hearers would remember the teaching. When Peter denied his Lord, the Lord said to him in Luke 22, 32, But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. 
And listen to this. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. There's a command from the Lord. Strengthen your brothers. The context is that Peter would be negligent if he did not fulfill his duties as a teacher. If he did not remind his brothers of what the, the Lord said. He had a responsibility as a Christian. We have that same responsibility. And as Kevin reminded us last week, a constant repetition is necessary. Verse 12 concludes by saying, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. Said, you, you know them. I know you know them. But he said, I'm going to remind you. There is no guarantee that in knowing the word is that you are going to remember it and most of all that you're going to do it. So I'm writing it down so you will have a permanent reminder. It's there for you. So Peter wrote it down so that they would remember it and it wouldn't be misquoted either once it's written down. And he says, if they didn't uh, write it down, they had to pass it down. Word of mouth. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a party game where they have the you know, game gossip, I think it's called, and they, you pass this message down one to the other and you, you see what the end story is. It changes dramatically. A lot of the time it doesn't sound anything like or even look anything like what it started. But I remember reading about an incident during the First World War and the battles going on at the front line they had no telephone, they had no radios, they had no, uh, yeah, they, the only means of communication was to say, hop on your bike and run, Just run back to headquarters, give them a message. And so they sent a messenger back to headquarters. The message was this, please send reinforcements, we're going to advance. The message that got through to headquarters was, please send three reinforcements. We're going to a dance. Now, the young people, probably not too many here, but the young people probably lose that. They don't know what three and fourpence is. It's the days of the old pounds, shillings and pence. There was three shillings and fourpence. But the message got changed. And so it is. We need to make sure that the message is sure, that it is uh, pure, that it is truth. And so the... Uh, message is uh, passed down or more better more fully it is given to us in god's word so uh, now peter knew that he was going to die very soon the chances are he's probably already in prison when he wrote this and he was on a death row and uh, he would soon die look at how peter puts that uh, event. He says, I know that I will soon put it aside. I know that I will soon put this tent aside. I don't need this tent anymore. I'm going to be with my Lord. I won't need the tent. He says, I'm going to put it aside. What a wonderful way to look at it. And so Peter was looking us forward to being with his Lord and he was prepared to die. But before he did, before he dies, he says, I have to be faithful and true. I have to do what God has told me to do. So, but Peter had another reason for reminding his readers. Readers, In verse 13, it says that it was the right thing to do. And it's always the right thing to stir up the saints, to remind them of the word of God. It is always right. There's never a wrong time to remember God's word. There's never a wrong time to uh, quote God's word, to use it. Peter wanted to remind his readers of what God expected of them. He knew that by writing them down, they would have a permanent record and they would not have to rely on the message being handed down by word of mouth. He knew that he was going to die soon. It was God's word would live on. Men die, but God's word is everlasting. Praise God. He wanted to ensure that they would always re be able to remember these things. And we have that record today for us to learn to remember. 
And we praise God that he's passed it down to us in this way. And we can remember them. Peter says in verse 15 that I will make every effort. Now that's the same word that he used in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5 when he gives us the instructions, make every effort to grow your faith. And in 2 Peter 1.10, he used the same word. It's been translated slightly differently. He says, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. It means to hasten to do something, to be zealous in doing it. Peter knew that he would soon die, so he wanted to take care of his spiritual responsibilities before it was too late. We don't know when our time's up. Peter was immortal until his work was finished. We don't know when our time is up. We should be prepared to share God's word and to you learn it and use it all the time. If we did not have the dependable word of God, the church would have to rely on men's memories. It, People pride themselves in having a good memory. There are memory games around and I'm amazed at how people can remember things. I just can't do that. But uh, somebody who prides themselves in having a good memory, they probably just need to sit in a courtroom and they can get three witnesses of the same event and you get three different events, three different recordings. They're all faithful and true witnesses, but our memories are defective. They're selective. We usually remember what we want to remember and often we even distort that. Fortunately, we can depend on the written word of God. It is written and it stands forever. We can be saved through this living word. 1 Peter 1.23 says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. We've been born again through the word of God. That never changes. We can be nurtured by it, 1 Peter 2.2. 2. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. We can feed on God's word. We can grow on God's word. And we can mature. We're encouraged to grow to maturity. We can be guided and protected by it as we trust him and obey. So now we go on to the second part of this reading. Is it, I'd say the eyewitness account of the transfiguration. I'll just read those verses again. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honour and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Peter is, is keen to make clear that when he taught them about the uh, Lord Jesus Christ's coming, that it was not a fable, it was true. It was not something man dreamed up. It was a revelation from God himself. In fact, that revelation came to Peter, James and John while they were on the mountain. They were accompanied with Christ. They were eyewitnesses. Mark 9, 9 says this. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders that not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. He was going to die, but he wasn't going to remain dead. He was going to rise again. And they were told, don't say anything about this until after that has happened. Matthew, Mark and Luke all give us the record of the Mount Transfiguration experience as it was handed down to them. But it is in 2 Peter chapter 1, the re reading where we have, where we get the only eyewitness account. Peter's own words, Peter's own experience. And that's special because Peter was there. And it was a revelation to Peter that had a tremendous impact on him in his life. 
Jesus is now alive and Peter is now free to share that experience. And we have it in the written word of God today. It was a real experience, not something dreamed up by mere man. Not a cleverly devised story. It was and it is real. And it is just as real for us today. God said, this is my beloved son. With him I am well pleased. Those words echoed in Peter's ears, even to the day when he is about to die. Because we have that testimony, we too know that it is real and we can apply it to our lives. Peter not only saw Christ's glory, but he heard the Father's voice from heaven. Peter was a witness to the, what God said. Now, witnesses are people who tell accurately what they have seen and heard. And Peter was a faithful witness. As Jesus Christ of Nazareth, is Jesus Christ of Nazareth the Son of God? Yes. How do you know? The Father said it. This is my beloved Son. God said it. I believe it. You can believe it. You and I were not eyewitnesses at the transfiguration. Peter was. And he faithfully recorded his experience for us in this letter, being inspired by the Spirit of God. When we have an experience, that experience can fade. But the Word of God remains. Experiences may be interpreted in different ways by different participants. But the Word of God gives one clear message. What we remember about our experience can be unconsciously distorted. But the written word of God remains the same and abides forever. The transfiguration also confirms the reality of God's kingdom. Because we have a completed Bible, we can look back and understand the progressive lessons that Jesus gave his disciples about the cross and the kingdom. But at that time, those 12 men were very confused. They did not understand the relationship between his suffering and his glory. They did not understand the relationship between the church and the kingdom. At the transfiguration, our Lord made it clear to his followers that his suffering would lead to his glory and that the cross would ultimately result in a crown. Let's have a look at the last part of the uh, reading and uh, Verses 19 to 21, God's prophetic word. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. What we have to remember is that in Peter's day, they did not have the New Testament. Certainly not as we have it. They may have had a couple of books, a couple of epistles. They had, maybe they had access to the Old Testament. Well, they had access to the Old Testament. They may not have had a, a copy of it because it was all handwritten, it would have been expensive. And they, uh, but what they had, they used. Now, um, a lot of people just don't like the Old Testament. I can't understand why they say, that it's old. That's what the Old Testament says, it's old. I don't like what's, I want the new, I want the new stuff. And, uh, so they don't read it, but I love it. There are gems of information in the Old Testament, which we do not get it, or at least not fully understand without the teaching of the Old Testament. Where else do we get an exhaustive outpouring of the names of God? Where each name gives an insight into the nature of God. Names like Jehovah Jireh. God is my provider in Genesis 22, 14. Or Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner in Exodus 17, 15. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace in Judges 6. 
or Jehovah said, can you? The Lord our righteousness. We just don't get that in the New Testament. We, we get references to righteousness. We get references to peace, but we don't get God is. And that's a big difference. And that one good reason to read the Old Testament because we can learn about God and the nature of God. I love to read in the Old Testament how the Holy Spirit spoke to men, holy men in the past, and told them of the coming world events. Things like a son being given, born, who would be a prince and a saviour and a king. As we read the Old Testament and see all the prophecies concerning Jesus' first coming being fulfilled, then we can face tomorrow confident that the prophecies written concerning Jesus' second coming will also be fulfilled. But to know that certainty, we need to know God's word. We need to read it to study it. Peter could say with full assurance that the prophecies of old came from God through the Holy Spirit. While men wrote down those words, it was God who inspired them. It is God's word. Therefore, we must study it to be approved workmen. Verse 19 says, the prophetic message is completely reliable. Or as the King James Version says, it is more sure. It appears that Peter may be quoting from Old Testament sources when he refers to the more sure word. For example, in Psalm 19.7, the testimony of the Lord is sure. In Psalm 93 verse 5, thy testimonies are very sure. Psalm 111 and verse 7, all his commandments are sure. But Peter takes it a step further. He said, it is more sure. God inspired the word. Therefore, it is trustworthy and reliable. It is more sure. The other way to say that is that God's word is truth and that we can rely on it because it is truth. It is God's word. God said it. I believe it. The transfiguration experience verified the prophetic promise. The false teachers would attempt to discredit the promise of his coming. And we're going to see that in chapter 3 of 2 Peter in a couple of weeks' time. But the scriptures were sure. They were completely reliable. For after all, the promise of the kingdom was confirmed by Moses, Elijah, the Son of God, and the Father. And the Holy Spirit wrote the record for the church to read. Psalm 19, verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The law is perfect and they're trustworthy. We can really trust God's word. God's word is like a light, it says in verse 19, shining in a dark place. Now Peter calls the world a dark place. And the word he used here for the dark place means murky. It's a picture of a dark, damp cellar or a dismal swamp. Human history began in a lovely garden, but that garden today is a murky swamp. What we see when we look at this world system is an indication of the spiritual condition of our heart. We still see God, the beauty in God's creation, but we see no beauty in what mankind is doing. Peter did not see this world as a garden of Eden, nor should we. It was a murky swamp. He says, God is light and his word is light. Psalm 119, 105, I don't have to read it, but I will. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When Jesus Christ began his ministry, it was reported in Matthew 4, 16, that Isaiah's prophecy was being fulfilled. And this is what Matthew 4, 16 says, the people living in darkness have seen a great light on whose living in the on those living in the land of the shadow of death a light has dawned i saw a great light the lord jesus christ himself we christians are the light of the world it is our privilege and responsibility to shine forth the word of life god's light so men might see the way and be saved. Philippians 4, 
verse 16 says this, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Listen to this. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. If we do live according to God's word, we will shine forth like stars in the sky. We will become blameless and pure. As believers, we must heed God's word and order our lives by what we say. For unbelievers, things are just going to get darker and darker. They're going to end up in eternal darkness. But God's people are looking for the return of Jesus Christ and the dawning of the new day. The false teachers scoffed at the idea of Christ's return and the dawning of a new day. We're going to learn that next week. But Peter affirmed the truth of the sure word of God. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. He says in 2 Peter 3.10. Before the day dawns, the day star or the morning star shines brightly to proclaim the start of a new day. I'm not usually up early enough to see the day star, but I'm told it's there. The day star heralding a new day. To the church, Jesus Christ is the bright and morning star. And we read that in Revelation 22, 16. The promise of his coming shines brightly, no matter how dark the day may be. How thankful we ought to be for God's sure and shining word. And how we ought to heed it in these dark days. And verse 20 says that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. It is the spirit's given word. It is the God inspired word. And there are two very important scriptures confirming that the word of God is inspired by God. There's this one, verse 20, and there's one in Second uh, Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. It's confirmed that it is God-breathed. Peter declared that the scriptures were not written by men who used their own ideas and words, but by men of God who were moved by the Holy Spirit. The word translated moved means to be carried along as a ship is carried by the wind. They went where God, they spoke as God told them to. They weren't, they weren't in control. God was in control. And in chapter two next week, we'll be learning more about the false teachers. And Peter is preparing us for that teaching. He's preparing us on how to be alert and defend ourselves against false teachers. Peter is refuting the doctrines of the false teachers. They taught with fabricated stories, fables, fairy tales. They twisted the scriptures to make them mean something that was not intended. And in so doing, they lead many astray. Peter is preparing his readers for the next chapter. Beware of false teachers. Now, I don't want to take away from the message next week, but I just want to say this that the best defense against being trapped by false teachers is to know God's word. If we study God's word, we will know false teaching. And that is exactly what Peter is stressing here today. Read the Bible. Read the Old Testament. Look at the eyewitness accounts we have in Scripture. Consider the prophecies of old and the fulfillment of so many of them so far. God has given us his word so that we will be encouraged by it. But we have to read it. We have to study it and apply it. I was reading in a book that was written about probably 60 years ago uh, about a, a Christian in India. And he was telling his friend about a great revival they were having. And he said in his faltering English, we are having a great revival. Not a bad idea. The church needs to be rebibled. May the Lord start with me, with each one of us here today. Let's study God's word. 
let it shine through us. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, your sure word. We thank you that it is trustworthy, that we can rely on it. And Lord, that you'll help us to interpret it with your Holy Spirit through us. Lord, thank you for your opening your word today. We thank you that we can learn from it, be nurtured, and we can grow to maturity. Help us, Lord, to do that, and help us to be lights shining in this dark world. In Christ's name, amen.